Welcome as we gather today here at Wesley Chapel United Methodist Church where neighbors find their place in God's family. Welcome as we gather for worship, for prayer, for fellowship. Um, welcome as we gather on this day. As we continue our uh, The Stories We Don't Tell worship series, I invite us to stand and sing together our first hymn, Wonderful, Wonderful Words of Life. Um, this is a hymn that talks about the beauty of scripture, um, all the stories, all the words of scripture. And so um, we'll sing this as our theme hymn, this worship series. It's number 600 in our blue United Methodist hymnal. I invite you to stand in body or spirit as we sing. Let us continue to lift our voices together in prayer as we share in the opening prayer printed in our bulletin. This too is our theme of prayer for this worship series. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Our first scripture today comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 38, verses 1 through 26. It happened at that time that Judah went down from his brothers and settled near a certain Adolamite, whose name was Hira. There, Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite, whose name was Shua. He married her and went into her. She conceived and bore a son and he named him Er. Again, she conceived and bore a son, whom she named Onan. Yet again, she bore a son, and she named him Shelah. She was the Shezeb who bore him. Judah took a wife for Er, his firstborn. Her name was Tamar. 
But Er, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her. Raise up offspring for your brother. But since Onan knew that the offspring would not be his, he spilled his semen on the ground whenever he went into his brother's wife so that he would not give offspring to his brother. What he did was displeasing in the sight of the Lord, and he put him to death also. Then Judah said to his daughter-in-law Tamar, Remain a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah grows up, for he feared that he too would die like his brothers. So Tamar went to live in her father's house. In the course of time, <clears throat> the wife of Judah, Shua's daughters died. When Judah's name, time had for warning was over, he went up to Tima to his sheep shearers, he and his friend Hira and Abdulamite. When Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep, she put off her widow's garments, put on a veil, wrapped herself up, and sat down at the entrance of Enam, which is on the road to Timnah. She saw that Sheila was grown up, yet she had not been given him to her in marriage. When Judah saw her, he thought her to be a prostitute, for she had covered her face. He went over to her at the roadside and said, Come, let me come in you, for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, What will you give me that you may come in me? And he answered, I will send you a kid from the flock. And she said, Only if you give me a pledge until you send it. He said, What is the pledge that I shall give you? She replied, Your, sig your signet and your cord and the staff that is in your hand. So she gave them to her and went into her, and she conceived by him. Then she got up and went away, and taking off her veil, she put on the garments of her widowhood. When Judah sent the kid by his friend to the Adulamite to recover the pledge from the woman, he could not find her. He asked the townspeople, Where is the temple prostitute who was at the Enum by the wayside? But they said, No prostitute has been here. So he returned to Judah and said, I have not found her. Moreover, the townspeople said, No prostitute has been here. Judah replied, Let her keep the things as her own. Otherwise, we will be laughed at, you see. I sent this kid, and you could not find her. About three months later, Judah was told, Your daughter-in-law, Tamar, has played the whore. Moreover, she is pregnant as a result of whoredom. And Judah said, Bring her out and let her be burned. As she was being brought out, she sent word up to her father-in-law. It was the owner of these who made me pregnant. And she said, Take note, please, whose are these, the signet and the cord and the staff? Then Judah acknowledged them and said, she is more in the right than I, since I did not give her my son, Sheila, and he did not lie with her again. Our second scripture today comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. This is the genealogy of Jesus. As an account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Amar, Amar the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Solomon, Solomon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife Uriah, and Solomon the father of Reboam, and Reboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph, Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat the father of Jodam, Joram the father of Uriza, 
Urizah, the father of Jothram, Jothram, the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the father of Manisha, Manisha, the father of Amos, Amos, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Johanna, and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jechariah and his father Shalathel, Shalathel the father of Zebro, and Zebro the father of Abu, Abu the father of Elikam, Elikam the father of Azor, Azor the father of Zadok, Zadok the father of Ashem, Ashem the father of Elud, Elud the father of Elozar, Elazar the father of Nathan, Nathan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, who was the husband of Mary, and whom Jesus was born, who was called the Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Gracious and holy God, your name is worthy. And the stories in the Bible are there for us to learn and grow and draw near to you. So as we have heard the scriptures read, your glory sung, and your grace being proclaimed, draw us near to you, God. Open our minds to know something new. 
Open our ears to hear you calling us forth in grace out of our own family stories. Open our hearts to your love. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. A beautiful wedding, a tragic death, a young widow, an available single brother, more family tragedy, a grieving father-in-law, a desperate daughter-in-law, pregnant with twins, accusation, then justice and redemption. Sounds like something that's probably out of a Lifetime movie network movie, or maybe a Hallmark movie, or I don't know, some drama that somebody wrote, but it is not. It is just another story in the Bible. And believe it or not, there are plenty of those stories that seem so dramatic that certainly they are not in the scriptures, and yet they are. Now our story today about Judah and Tamar comes after a story you might already know. It's the story of Joseph, the one with the Technicolor dream coat, right? Joseph has just been sold into slavery by his brothers. In fact, it was Judah's idea to sell him in just the chapter before, chapter 37, Judah says, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. So Judah, the same Judah in our story from the Old Testament today, he sells his brother into slavery. He's a part of the cover-up. He helps his father think that a wild animal had devoured and killed his brother. And then he moves away. Maybe there's some guilt in there. Maybe he doesn't want to see his father in the state of mourning that he helped bring about. Only Judah knows why, but he moved away. He marries a Canaanite woman. I remember... We talked about the Ammonites and the Moabites last week being the bad guys in the Old Testament. Well, the Canaanites were too. So Judah moves away, marries a Canaanite woman, and together they have three sons, Ur, Onan, and Shelah. So the oldest one, Ur, is ready to be married. And Judah does what any good father of that day and age would do. He finds his son a good wife. Her name is Tamar. So before we continue this story, because it gets wild, before we continue this story, I want to pause for a moment. Because if you read the Bible closely, if you believe that the Bible is the infallible word of God, if you have a literal translation, a literal reading of the Bible, you may notice that there are some inconsistencies already. Now, this story about Judah and Tamar is inserted into the Joseph story. And there may not be enough time for all of the things that are said to have happened to have happened. You see, between Ju um, Joseph's disappearance and when all of the brothers, including Judah, go to Egypt to buy grain after the famine, there's about 20 years that happens there. So this story about Judah and Tamar... In 20 years, Judah moved away, got married, had three sons, the oldest of which got married to Tamar. The family tragedies happened. All the time a mourning had passed, Judah got Tamar pregnant, and the twins were born. All in 20 years? Seems a little unlikely. Another inconsistency, if you read the Bible closely, the names of Judah's sons, Ur, Onan, and uh, Shelah, they actually, in other places in the Old Testament, appear in other family genealogies, sometimes even in non-Israelite groupings. So what do we do with that? What do we do when things in the Bible don't seem to line up, either with its own information, right, or with other reliable historical information we have? What do we do? 
Well, we remember that the Bible is a library of books. Each book its own style and purpose. The Bible has books of history, poetry, letters, prophetic writing, law, wisdom, narrative, and genealogy. The Bible has these important family origin stories. So just like the origin story of the Ammonites and the Moabites from last week, this family narrative of Judah and Tamar tucked into the bigger story of Joseph, this is its own origin story. It sets up Judah as this entity of its own that will eventually be in the southern part of that area. This family origin story helps explain the close links between what we later know as the tribe of Judah and then the indigenous people, the Canaanites. And if you look at the larger picture of the story of the clans of Judah, this story, this little story of Judah and Tamar, explains the early disappearance of the clans of Ur and Onan. So this original family origin story, written down long after the events happened and from family tradition as it was passed down from generation to generation to generation, this family story explains so much of what happens later in the Old Testament. It explains the whys, and in a colloquial way, it explains the how comes. Right? So, on pause, back to our story. Tamar had just married Ur, Judah's oldest son. Now, verse 7 tells us that Ur was wicked in the Lord's sight. So the Lord put him to death. Well, what was the evil or the wickedness? We don't know. But it certainly seems that Ur died young. Remember that ancient peoples would have thought that an early death was some kind of punishment for wrongdoing. And so adding this little detail into the story would have served as sort of a warning to the Israelites later. Follow God, do right by God, or else this will happen. So Ur dies young and his wife is left with no sons. And the lineage of Ur the inheritance of Ur would end. Well, this is the reason that the cultural tradition, the culture of that time had a custom. If a man died, and he was married, and he left no sons, the next eligible brother would then sleep with the widow in hopes of providing a son that would then be raised in the name of the dead brother thus securing the lineage and the inheritance of that older brother. So Onan, the next brother in line, he sleeps with Tamar. And if you read closely, we get the impression that it happens multiple times. But Onan knew that the son everybody was hoping for wouldn't actually be his own. So why would he want his father's inheritance divided three ways with his brother's son that was actually biologically his, when if he didn't actually provide a son for his brother, the inheritance would only be divided in two ways. So more for him, right? So Onan does what looks like is the right thing, but he's really only taking advantage of the whole situation taking advantage of Tamar. And scripture says that Onan spilled his seed on the ground, and for those that are old enough to read between the lines, this is coitus interruptus. He enjoys all the fun of being the dutiful brother-in-law without any of the responsibility. So Onan dies too. At this point in the story, Tamar has been with two of Judah's sons, and they have both died. So do you think that Judah's going to let her be with the youngest son, the last one too? Probably not. She seems a little like a black widow. So he sends Tamar back to her father's house. Well, then at some point, Judah's wife dies, and after a period of mourning, he goes into town with friends. 
completely vulnerable and utterly desperate, Tamar hatches a plan. She knows this family. She knows that she really no longer has a place in Judah's family. And because she'd already been given away in marriage, she actually really doesn't have a place in her own father's family either. Tamar knows that Sheila is grown and he's not going to be asked to fulfill his duty. She also knows that Judah probably will be hungry for female companionship. So she disguises herself and sits at the entrance and waits. And just as expected, Judah comes along and purchases her services, promising to bring back the proper payment. So Tamar is smart. She asks for collateral. Again, she knows this family well, so she asks for the things that she knows that Judah has that will be undeniably his. Things that no one would dispute belong to Judah. So they depart ways. Time passes, and Judah gets wind that his daughter-in-law has been sleeping around and is pregnant. So Judah calls for the punishment of the culture of the day. This kind of crime, a woman could be burned to death. Double standard, isn't it? Judah can sleep with someone, not his wife, and have no punishment, but Tamar does it, and she's supposed to be burned? Hmm. Tamar, despite uh, desperate to claim her rightful place in Judah's family, she was smart. She called him out. She saved her life, literally, and reclaimed her place in Judah's family. So, Judah and Tamar's twins are born, Perez and Zerah. Perez was the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, and so on down the line, as you heard, to Jesus Christ. And Tamar, I don't know if you picked it up, she is the first of only four women to be mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus. Tamar, Rahab, Uriah's wife, which we know as Bathsheba, and Mary. So once again, a family tragedy, a family origin story, one that didn't start off well, once again is redeemed through Jesus Christ. One woman trying to claim her place in a family ultimately brings forth the one who gives us all a place in the family of God. Now, we read these stories separate from one another. We don't ever look at the big picture, rarely do. And so these stories are no small, insignificant thing. Because we all have a family story, don't we? I do. We all have family tragedy. Most every family has a story with betrayal, some kind of untimely death, deception, injustice, abuse. Men in our families have made decisions out of loneliness and greed. Women in our families have made decisions out of desperation and heartache. No family is without some kind of messed up story. And if you think yours is, my guess is that nobody's just probably told you that story yet. Like the messed up story of Judah and Tamar, Jesus is redeeming our family stories too. And when we feel like we don't have a place, like we no longer belong in our own family of origin, or maybe the family that we married into, or maybe the family that's in our household, when we feel like we don't belong, we can rest in knowing that Jesus has made a way for us. Jesus has made a way for us to have a place in the family of God. We don't have to have a perfect family, we don't have to have a perfect story, and we don't have to be perfect, certainly. But when we take these messed up stories, when we take our family messed up stories, our own personal messed up stories, when we take them and we give them to God, God can and will use them 
for the glory of God. God can and will use them to help people know that Jesus has made a way for them to be a part of the family of God too. So as we later pray uh, in our worship service, I invite you to think about those messed up family stories and offer them to God for the glory of God. Because you have a place in God's family. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we continue our time of worship, I invite us to respond to what we've heard by singing hymn 2220 in the Black Faith We Sing hymnal. This is a hymn called um, We Are God's People. We've sung it before, but it's been a while. So um, listen as Jane plays the first ver the verse through all the way, and then we'll join in. I invite you to stand in body or spirit as we sing. You may be seated. As we go to God in prayer, I invite you, when the time comes, to lift up any prayer concerns you might have 
and we will respond as we do. Uh, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer, and then we will join together in the Lord's Prayer. So let us pray. Gracious, holy, almighty God, we come before you this day lifting to you our messed up family stories. The tragedy, the betrayal, the heartache, the desperation, all of it. God, we give them to you, and we trust that you will redeem them. We give them to you so that your glory might be known in the redemption. And as we give these family stories to you, God, we know that there is much pain and heartache, not just in our own families, but in our neighborhoods and workplaces and communities across the globe. So hear us as we lift the needs to you today. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, in your mercy. Emily Parker. Lord, in your mercy. And Lord, we lift to you uh, women everywhere, those who are mothers, who want to be mothers, those who wanted children, those who unexpectedly found themselves with children, and those who have lost their children. Lord, we lift up motherhood that seems everything that it's supposed to be, and we lift up motherhood that is filled with heartache. We lift up the moms that are great and the moms that aren't perfect. We lift up the women who are like moms to all of us. And as we lift this all to you, God, hear us as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we come to our time of sharing um, opportunities to learn, serve, and give, you can see on the back of your bulletin, we have some opportunities coming up. Immediately after worship, we'll be packing our last um, backpack buddies for the school year, and so we invite you to um, come into the fellowship hall and be a part of that. There's a meeting this Thursday. Um, the United Methodist Foundation will be here to talk to us about opportunities um, that they offer for churches and individuals. Trustees are meeting. Um, Friday is the Impact Youth Lock-In. Next Sunday is Pentecost. So um, we'll be having a Pentecost worship service. We invite you to wear red that day. We'll have our annual birthday luncheon after, so bring a dish to share. We'll also be celebrating our high school graduates next week um, as well during worship. So we hope that you will be with us on that day. One of the things that uh, you hear me say a lot, uh, or at least I hope you hear me say a lot, is that um, I hope that you are listening for God's voice and God's call on your life. And so as we go um, to our time of offering, I want, you to, I want to tell you a personal story of mine that has been a year in the making. So last April, um, that was the end of last school year, I heard three people in less than 24 hours tell me something. 
that seemed totally foreign to me. And I know well enough that when I hear three people tell me the same thing in a short amount of time, I should probably start paying attention, right? So I said, God, I don't understand this. You need to help me out. Because those three people were a student, a chaplain, and my husband. So I started listening, and I started praying, and I started having conversations. And over the next several months, many more people told me the same thing. So, if you notice, I'm wearing yellow and black today. In addition to serving as the pastor here at Wesley Chapel, starting June 1st, I will also be the chaplain at Pfeiffer University. Um, I'm excited, and I hope that you all will be praying for me and with me as we, um, I don't know, figure out this partnership and what that looks like. Never would have imagined myself doing that, and yet I know it is exactly where God wants me to be. So that starts June 1st, and then I stay here with you all at Wesley Chapel as well. So ushers, would you come as we share our tithes and our offerings today? Almighty God, we give you thanks for everything that has been offered to you today. We give you thanks for the stories that have been offered, the prayers that have been offered, the time that has been offered, and these tithes and offerings. We give them to you, God, and trust that you will give us the wisdom to use it all in a way that brings you glory. We ask this in the, in the name of Jesus. Amen. As we prepare to leave this time and place of worship and go about the rest of our day, I invite us to sing together hymn 405 in the blue United Methodist hymnal, Seek Ye First.
Our flowers today in worship have been in honor of Irene Peeler. And so if you want to be able to give flowers in honor of someone as well, the sign-up sheet's out in the hall. As we leave this time of worship today, go remembering that you belong. You have a place in the family of God. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen.